Okay, we're back looking at 1 Timothy. We made it down to verse number 7. But look at verse 6. It says, From which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling. So they're doing a bunch of vain jangling, a bunch of empty talk, saying a bunch of stuff that amounts to nothing. Saying a bunch of stuff, you know, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. Desiring to be teachers of the law, it says in verse 7. Understanding neither what they say, nor whereof they affirm. So they desire to be teachers of the law, and they don't understand what they're saying. Just like Peter talks about how they rest the scriptures to their own destruction. They don't understand what Paul wrote. Look at 2 Peter 3, 15 through 16, and I'll show you that. You know, sometimes people, they do not understand Paul's epistles. They do not understand that uh, Paul is the Paul is our apostle, and his epistles are primarily for us today. 2 Peter chapter 3. Second Peter three fifteen through sixteen. Second Peter three fifteen through sixteen says an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. You see, they don't understand Paul, they don't understand the other scriptures, and they rest this stuff to their own destruction. They desire to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say, nor whereof they affirm. They don't understand that Paul said, it's by grace through faith without works. They don't understand that the law can't get you nowhere. It's your schoolmaster to bring you to Christ, but it can't get you salvation. It says, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. And Paul's writings, some of the things in it are hard to be understood, some of the doctrine. So men are going to take his, the scriptures of uh, the Pauline epistles and rest it to their own destruction. And keeping the laws can't save you. But rather, the law shows you that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. Let's look at some verses in regards to that. Uh, Galatians 2.16 Yeah, go back a little bit to the left. Galatians 2.16. Really well-known verse here in Galatians 2.16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. Notice that, not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So nobody justified by the works of the law. Then look at Galatians 3.24. Galatians 3.24. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So the law, what it does is, it shows you that you're a sinner and that you cannot keep God's law. Nobody ever kept it perfectly. It's your schoolmaster to bring you to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ did all the work for you. Jesus Christ kept the law perfectly. 
Jesus Christ did the work for your salvation, and you just rest in his finished work. The law is your schoolmaster to bring you to him. And you got a lot of people going around desiring to be teachers of the law. And then they're trying to act like the law is what gets you in, and it doesn't. So look at 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 8. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. You can use the law lawfully. You can use the law the right way. How do you do that? Well, to show a man he needs salvation. Because all have broken the law. You cannot prove... Um, or you can't point a man to the law for justification. But you can point a man to the law to show him that he needs to be saved. The, the law can't get you saved, but it can show you that you need to be saved. You point him to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You can't point a righteous man to the law to show him that he is justified. You point him to the gospel and ask if there was the moment that he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. So you can use the law lawfully. You point a man to the law to show him that he's a sinner. But then you got to point him to the gospel to show him how to be saved. That's how you can use it lawfully. It says in verse 9, Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers. So the law is, the law is not made for a righteous man. Keeping the law couldn't bring the results that the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ brought me. The law is not made for a righteous man. You see, I, if you are a righteous man, then you've got the righteousness of Jesus Christ on you that was applied to you the moment you believed. The law is not made for you. It's made for the lawless. What's well, lawless? Those that's not subject to law, they're not, they're not bringing themselves in subjection to any law, the lawless. It's made for the lawless and disobedient. Who's that? Those that won't do what's commanded, rebels. It's made for the ungodly. Who's that? Well, people that's that's just godless. Going around living like there's there's no God, basically. And Christians do that many times. Uh, Jude talked a lot about him over in <clears throat> his epistle where he was talking about what Enoch said. And Enoch has had a had that little sermon there. You know, it wasn't recorded back in Genesis, but it was recorded in Jude. And he talked a lot about the ungodly. It says uh, in Jude, verse 14, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are, now look at what it says these ungodly people are, murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Ungodly. Living like there is no God. It says it's for the lawless, the disobedient, for ungodly, and for sinners. Now here, sinners is, Paul's using it in the, in the Jewish sense, 
which would be extremely wicked people. Now, sometimes when Paul used the word sinners, he's he referring to everybody. Me, you, himself, everybody. But then sometimes in the Bible, it's referring to it as, when, you, when they say sinners, it's referring to the extremely wicked people. For example, turn to Luke 7 for, and verse 39. Luke 7, 39. And I'll show you an example of it being used for an extremely wicked person and not just their average person. Luke 7, 39. It says, Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. You see, sometimes it's used in the sense of an extremely wicked person and not just your average person. You know, Paul used it in both ways sometimes. When it, you know, like Romans 3.23 for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all sinners, but sometimes the word sinners is used in the sense of an extremely wicked person. So, we know the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane. So, okay, unholy. Okay, that's the opposite of God. You know, in 1 Peter 1, 16, he said, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Anything opposite of God is unholy. And you know, that word is glorified today. They got that popular song uh, that was played at the Grammys that people sit and watched called Unholy with a guy dressed up like a devil using that those words, the whole song was called Unholy, I believe. But it's the opposite of God, just godless. It's the op If you're unholy, you're the opposite of God and His words. Okay, profane. What's profane? Someone who doesn't care about the things of God. That's pretty much the world today. They don't care about the things of God. As Esau, in Hebrews 12, 16, Look at Hebrews 12, 16 really quick. Esau thought it was more important for that pot of chili than he did what he was getting from God. Look at Hebrews 12, 16. It says, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. He thought one morsel of meat was more important than his God-given birthright, and he sold his birthright for that pot of meat. He's profane. Doesn't care about the things of God one bit. And is irreverent to the things of God. That's what profane is. That's who the law is made for, the lawless, disobedient, ungodly, sinners, unholy, profane. So, verse 7, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. They just don't get it. They're trying to use the law, put the law on you today. They don't understand Paul's epistles that teach salvation by grace through faith without works but we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully you can still use the law you can use it to point someone to, to the fact that they are a sinner in need of a savior but the law can't save them you can use the law to <clears throat> to um, encourage holy living in your life you know you're supposed to still do the things from the Old Testament. It's not all just out the door. 
Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. You know, those things are still good for you today. They don't save you, obviously. But you still need to be living a holy life. You don't want to be ungodly.